The purpose of this video is to discuss the list object, all of its uses and features, and all of its various properties. So we're going to have a full overview of everything that the list object can and cannot do. So the list object can be added to any experiment by taking it from the toolbox and dragging and dropping it anywhere into the experiment. I'm just going to put it on my session proc right here. Now the default name of any list object is list with a number after it. The number represents the number of list objects that are currently in use with this name. So right now I have no list objects in my experiment, so it is called list1. If I were to drag another one, it would be called list2 and so on. You can rename list objects either in the properties page down here or by right clicking on them and clicking rename. And I'll just call this one sample list. Generally speaking, the name of a list object should reflect the property or the procedure that is going to follow it. So if I were to actually put this in my experiment right here, it would most likely be called block list because it would be used to create a block procedure, but we'll talk about that later. So if you double click on it to open it in the workspace, you'll notice that it's a relatively blank looking thing, but it's actually very important. And I'll go over some of the more important features. One of the most striking features about a list object is this, uh, this Excel looking spreadsheet thing down here. So this is actually where all the manipulation of the list object occurs. The first column that you have is called ID. Columns are another way for us to call attributes. So these columns here are otherwise in E' known as attributes. You can also refer to them as columns in a list object, but if you go ahead and add any attribute by clicking on the add attribute button, you'll see that anything that you add just to the right of the word procedure here will show up in this attributes tab in your experiment browser. So the ID column just represents the ID number of that particular row of the list object. So this one is one. If I were to add another one, it would say two and three and four and so on. The next one is the weight column. The weight determines how many times that particular row is sampled by this list object. Right now it is currently set to one. Therefore E prime will sample this row only once and then we'll move on. The nested column allows you to nest another list inside this list. Um, that is actually just called nested lists. Uh, this is a relatively um, more advanced feature of E'. It allows you to create a cross section of variables or a cross section of exemplars without having to write all of them out in a list object. And the last column we have by default is called procedure. Now a procedure object, any, uh, anything typed into the procedure object here is going to create a new procedure under the list object. So if you look here, I have session proc, that is my current procedure. Anything that I type in here will create a new procedure called whatever I put in there, and it will show up underneath this list object. So this is how we control the flow of the experiment in E prime. Now these buttons up here are all very important. This first button on the left is to add another level to the list object. So clicking on it once will give you um, ID number two or row number two. So you can add different levels if you would like multiple procedures or if you have different types of stimuli to show. The next button here is add multiple levels. And then once you click on that, you get to specify how many levels you want to add. So for example, if I opt to add three different levels, it will add three different rows going down. Next is this add attribute. Now those are those columns that I had spoken about earlier. If you click on add attribute, it will first prompt you to input the attribute's name. We'll keep it at its default of attribute one, and it'll ask you to input its default value. So what would I like the default value of this attribute to be? We'll keep it a question mark and then go ahead and click add. So now you'll see that I've added a new attribute to my list object, which appears as a new column in the list object. And if I hop over to my attributes button here, you'll see that my attribute one that I just made now shows up in my list of attributes. These attributes can be referenced at any point in the experiment, either using an attribute reference in square brackets or if you're using script, using a c.getAttrib statement. The next button is add multiple attributes. I'm gonna add multiple columns to my list object. And if I opt to add three more, you can see that they just auto number and all appear next to each other. You do not have the option to edit the name or edit the default value of these add multiple attributes, but you can edit the name and default value by simply double clicking on the title. So if you double click on the title and opt to change the name of one of the attributes, so example, if for example I change this attribute to attribute five, it will change the name. If I opt to edit its default value from question mark, let's say to exclamation point, it's not going to add that change until I add a new level and then the new default value will appear there. So the next button here we have is called hide summary. And what it's going to do is it's just going to make this summary that we have right here disappear. 
and this can be toggled either on or off. Now the summary part of it here lets you know how many samples you have. So in this case, I have six samples or six rows. And then one cycle is how long this list object is set to run, and we'll discuss that later, of six samples per cycle. Then it tells us that one cycle is equal to six samples, and that EPrime is going to um, sequentially select items from this list object. If I click on the properties page here, we can dive into some of the more specific properties. Now the first one that we have is general tab. We can load this list object and all of its exemplars in multiple ways. The first one in the most recommended way is just embedded. Embedded means that you're actually typing the values onto the list object. We also have the option to load a list object or the values of a list object from a tab delimited.txt file. And then you have the option to create these objects in inline script and have EPrime reference them that way. Generally speaking though, we recommend keeping the default value of embedded. Under the common tab, you have the option to change the name. If there's a tag, the tag is just a, honestly a personal tag, just something that you can put on it but don't necessarily need. And if there are any notes associated with this list object that you would like other people to look at in the future. Now the selection tab allows you to select the order at which these items are being selected. So if we click on the order, you can see that right now the default value is set to sequential. So E-prime is going to select items in the following order. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six. And it's going to keep going one, two, three, four, five, six until you tell the list object to stop. What random will do is random will randomize all of the items in the list object and will, once an exemplar has been shown, opt to not show it again. So for example, if E-prime shows my second exemplar here, or my second ID, then it, it, it doesn't have a chance of coming up again. It will then move on to one, three, four, five, and six as the other possible exemplars. However, random with replacement has the option to add that back into the list of possible exemplars. So for example, if E prime chooses two, it then has the same random probability of choosing two again. Counterbalance is a little different. Counterbalance actually only selects one item from the list object, and you can change by what value it chooses that one item. So this order by property here that you can see just activated whenever I chose counterbalance allows me to pick how I'm counterbalancing this. So am I counterbalancing by the subject ID that I input at the beginning of the experiment? Am I choosing by session ID that I also input or group, which I could also input? And all counterbalance does was it'll only, it will only take one exemplar from this list object, show that one exemplar, and then we'll move on from the list. And the same thing's gonna happen with offset, only it's going to be offset by a certain value. So for example, if my subject is one, it's going to offset the presentation of this list object by one. Permutation is kind of like a mix between the random feature and the counterbalance feature. So if I click apply and okay here, you'll see that it's actually going to offset by the number that we have. So if I, again, if I choose an offset of, let's say one, it's going to show all exemplars, but it'll offset it by one. Permutation here, if I add permutation, it's actually going to uh, randomize, but then we'll offset that permutation and that randomization by either the subject ID, the session ID, or the group number. And then I have this new option for E-Prime 3 called interactive list. Now what the interactive list does is while the while E-Prime is running or while this, while this experiment is running, E-Prime will actively display the items in this list object and will allow you to interact with the list and choose which exemplars you're actively showing to participants. Um, and you can choose which display this dialog is going to appear on and if there are any cover visuals, which we don't have any added by default. Then we have our summary or our reset exit tab, and I'm going to actually change this back to random so we can see some of the reset exit properties. So if you look at the top here, we see our summary one more time. It tells you that we have six samples total in it. We're going to run one cycle and six samples equals one cycle. Now we're using random selection. Now on the left hand side here, you can choose when to reset sampling. So do you want E-Prime to stop what it's sampling here and then re-randomize after all the samples have been run? Or would you like it to do that after two samples have been run or after three samples have been run? These will of course differ based on your paradigm. We'll go ahead and keep it uh, at all samples for now. And then you have the option to have E-Prime reset at the beginning of each run. So every time it encounters this list object, do you want it to remember the randomization that it used before or would you like it to reset? Then on the right hand side here, you have exit list. So this exit list property is after however many cycles you want. So how many times are we cycling through these exemplars before E prime moves on from this list object? Are we doing two, which means we now have 12 samples, which means every item that we have on this list object will be repeated twice. Or are we doing 12, which means we have 72 samples. 
or do we keep it at its default at one? You can also have it choose to re-exit the list after a certain number of samples. So if the number of samples that you would like doesn't divide easily by the number of uh, rows that you have there, let's say I wanted to only run 15 samples, I can opt to have it do that as well. And then if your um, task is strictly based on time, you can have it reset or exit the list after however many seconds you put in. And in this case, I'm just gonna have it set to exit list after one sample, otherwise you get that error message. Now as far as the view, this allows you to hide levels that you, want, that you don't wanna see. So for example, if I don't wanna see the weight column, I could uncheck that, click apply, and you no longer see the weight. You can do the same thing for procedure and nested. They also go away, and the only thing you can see there are your custom-made attributes. Now this option here, hide levels with zero weight value, is kind of a bit of a trick in E-Prime. So if you ever do not want E-Prime to currently run one of these rows in, e or in your experiment, all you have to do is change the value from one to zero. If you can see here, E-Prime is going to gray out that entire row. So that means during this run of the experiment, E-Prime is not going to run exemplar four. And in my view here, I have the option to go ahead and toggle that off so then I don't even see rows that aren't run. All I notice is that my ID jumps from three to five and four isn't seen. Now with logging, this allows you to turn on or off logging for any attribute that you create. By default, all of the attributes are set to log and these will all show up in your data file, but there's a, if there's any one that you do not want to show up in your data file, all you have to do is just uncheck it and click apply, and whenever you do that, all of the attributes will turn red. If they are red, that means they will not be logged in E-Prime. And then finally, we have task events. This feature is added to every object. We're gonna talk about this in great length, but what it allows you to do is it allows you to either send a signal or um, interact with some script that you've written based on, on any point in, in this list objects function. So for example, before interactive dialogue, after interactive dialogue, I can have E-Prime uh, do script, I can have E-Prime send a signal to an external device, those types of things. And I'm definitely gonna get into that in later videos but just know that you do have the option to send task events during these list objects. Now the last two properties that we have to talk about are pretty similar. The first one here is remove row. So if I were to highlight a row on my list object and I no longer want this one, what I would do is click on this remove levels and I click on that and then click, uh, click yes. You can notice that level goes away. And the other one I have is to remove an attribute. I simply highlight anything that I want by clicking that down arrow and then clicking on remove attribute and it will go away. So that's really all there is to the list object. It's a pretty simple feature. It's very powerful though in E-Prime as it can control the flow of the experiment by manipulating what procedures show up. It can control the cross section of exemplars by editing this nested list column and it can control all of the independent variables in your experiment by editing any attributes here. And definitely check out some of our other videos to see how these list objects are used in E-Prime. Thank you very much. That's all I have for today and have a great day.